This is a continuation of the video, the introduction video on leases. And in this video, I'm going to explain in, as, uh, in a mathematical way how the accounting for the finance lease occurs. So let me remind you of the criteria that should be met very briefly. So in a previous video, I talked about what the tests are for the leasee and the leasor in order to determine whether this is a finance lease or an operating lease. And in a nutshell, if you meet one, if the lease is non cancelable and you meet one of these criteria, then we consider the lease a financing lease. And what happens is, and for the lease or it's a sales type lease. And what happens after that is that you will, the leasee will record an asset and a liability on the balance sheet, and then the lease or records a sale of the asset. So let's look at what happens. Assume that we have a lease that uh, starts on January 1st of X1, whatever year that may be. On the day, and, and we've determined that this is a finance lease through the test, okay? So on the day that we actually uh, uh, have this lease and the asset, then we will capitalize an amount for the asset and record a liability, in, and that amount is based on X. Okay, so X is going to be, let me move this up a little bit so it looks better. <clears throat> X is going to be the present value of the payments, and let's call the payments Y, whatever that amount may be, plus the present value of some B amount, which represents any probable amount that you think will be owed from the guaranteed residual value if the leasee guarantees a residual value. So in other words, if the leasee says, I guarantee that after the lease term, this asset is going to be worth um, $1,000. Okay, so that's the guaranteed residual value. If the leasee determines that it's probable that it's going to be worth $1,000 at the end, then you don't have to include anything in here. But as an example, if the leasee says, okay, we guarantee $1,000, but the leasee knows that or thinks that it will be worth only $700, then technically the leasee will owe the difference of $300. So if that's the case, if the leasee has an amount B, in this case $300, that they think they will owe from the guarantee that they made, then they have to include that present value as part of uh, the amount that is capitalized to the uh, right of use asset and the amount of the liability. Furthermore, if you have a bargain purchase option and it's reasonably, uh, it's reasonably going to be exercised, reasonably likelihood to be exercised, then we would include the present value of that bar bargain purchase option. Because recall, if you have the ability to purchase this asset at the end as the leasee at a very low price, a bargain, then any reasonable person would exercise that option. Okay, so because of that, we say, well, that becomes part of the cost of the asset that you're buying and part of the liability. So when I say that the right of use asset is going to be determined at X, it's going to be determined at the present value of all the payments you make per the contract, present value of any amount B that you think you're going to owe, you know, from guaranteeing a residual value, plus the present value of a bargain purchase option. And that's what your initial uh, value is going to be on the books. Now, since leases are technically uh, transactions in which you pay before the period, at the same time that you uh, get this asset and put it to use, at that same time, you're going to make your first lease payment. And we're going to call that amount Y, just like we did right here. So on the first day that you acquire this, you make your first monthly payment and that reduces the lease liability and uh, reduces cash by Y amount. Now, later on, you'll see like in this example that we have to accrue the amount of interest expense and amortization expense because of the fact that this is a financing ar arrangement. But since this first payment is being made uh, prior to any time passing after the January 1st, then no interest has accrued and no amortization of the right of use asset occurs as well. So it's a real straightforward for the first payment. Okay. Uh, just a couple little side notes here since we're talking about this initial 
journal entry. If under the lease terms, the asset has no residual value or uh, the residual value is unguaranteed by the leasee, then you just ignore that information. It just does not become part of the present value. So anytime you have something where there's no re residual value or it's unguaranteed residual value, uh, and just for sake of uh, conversation here, I'll call this uh, URV, just so I don't have so many words everywhere. <laughs> if, it's a, if you have an unguaranteed residual value, then you just ignore it. The other thing is that if you do have a bargain purchase option like we described here, okay, we know that we have to include that in the present value, which comes up in X. But here's the other thing. If you have a bargain purchase option and you reason, it's reasonable that you're going to exercise it, then the amortization for the right of use asset is not based on the term of the lease, but at that point, it's going to be based on the economic life of the actual asset. Because technically, if you're going to exercise that option, that asset is going to be with you, the leasee is going to be with you for its economic life, not just the term of the lease. Okay, so just a little side note there that we got to keep in mind. All right, what happens as, as time passes, okay? And this, this doesn't have to be uh, once a year. It could be, you know, monthly, quarterly, whatever. But in this case, I'm going to do the accrual of interest and the amortization of the right of use asset on a, a, as of the end of the year, okay? So like any loan, we're going to do a amortization schedule and we're going to uh, calculate how much interest expense is involved based on the carrying value of the loan. Okay, so this calculation here for the interest expenses is going to be uh, based on the carrying value at the beginning of the period times the rate, whatever the interest rate is, and that gives you an amount called Z. And as time will pass, the carrying value of that loan decreases, so you will have less interest expense to recognize as the lease term uh, passes. And that adjustment is a reduction to lease liability. Because in essence, this whole amount Y that we paid, not all of it, and here's the way you can think about it, not all of it went to reduce the liability. So th that amount that did not go to reduce liability, either reduce the principal or the carrying value, we put it back into the liability. Okay? Um, and then in terms of the right of use asset itself, since technically this is our asset, we're going to amortize it or, or if you want to think of it we're going to depreciate it but in the case of leases we refer to it as amortization so we're going to amortize it over whatever term that may be the lease term or if there's a bargain purchase option over the economic life of that asset and whatever that amount may be we're just going to debit it to a and reduce the uh, right of use asset and if it helps you think of this credit right here as uh, sort of an acute a credit to accumulated depreciation of the asset a but instead, we're going directly into the right of use asset and reducing it by that amount. Okay, so after you do these entries for the term of the lease, your amortization schedule will end up having a zero balance. Uh, so just to kind of give you an idea, on January 1st of X2, you're going to have this payment amount right here, right? The same thing. And then on 1231 X2, you're going to have these amortization amounts to calculate and this accrual expense to uh, calculate. And now it'll be different for the interest expense in X2. All right. I do have a couple little notes here. Uh, one of them says, look, if, you're, if you have an amount B that you're including as part of X, then obviously that amount is going to increase Z and A over time because, you know, your, your liability is going to be higher your right of use at asset is going to be higher. So when you compute the interest expense, it's going to be higher. When you compute the amortization expense, it's going to be higher as well. So I'm just trying to get you to visualize how this mathematically will work into the equation. And if you have that amount that you guarantee, the residual value amount that you guarantee, um, then at the end, when you do all these journal entries that I just described, your amortization schedule will not zero out. You'll have one more journal entry to do, and that will be the one for the amount that you think you're going to owe that you capitalized initially and that you recorded as a liability. So I think in my uh, simplistic example, I said we guaranteed a residual value of 1000 uh, but we only thought 
it would be end up being worth 700 so we have to add 300 well after the whole term of the lease comes up you would debit that 300 here for b amount whatever that is and then credit cash because you're paying that amount and after this then your amortization schedule is going to zero out okay so i know this is very mathematically uh, uh, described but uh, hopefully this this gives you an idea once you start doing the problems and uh, i'll show you an exercise later on in a different video so that you can see how i apply this in an exercise now i just described what the lease c does from the lease source perspective the finance lease, the finance uh, lease is called the sales type lease, right? So let's just be very clear about that. This is a sales type lease. And from the leases, I'm, I'm sorry, from the lease source perspective, they're going to recognize revenue because they've sold this asset. They're going to also recognize an expense for the cost of the asset itself. In other words, taking the asset out of the books. So this F amount is for whatever the cost of that asset was originally. So that's easy to understand. This is the debit cost of it sold and credit inventory or whatever the name of the asset is. But let's go, let's go look at it, uh, the E amount here. So the E amount is going to be the present value of the payments, just like it was for the leasee. But here's where things change a little bit. The leasee is going to also include the present value of any guaranteed residual value. So if the leasee guarantees an amount, the leasor can include that as part of the sale. And, and the way you got to think about it is if a leasee is guaranteeing it, it's like I sold this if I'm a leasor. I, it's like I sold that component of the asset as well. I sold the residual value. So because of that, I can include that as part of my revenue. Okay. And then similarly, like, similarly to the leasee, if there's a bargain purchase option, same thing. You include that bargain, the present value of that bargain purchase option, uh, if it's reasonably to be, you know, reasonably likely to, uh, to be exercised, likely to be exercised because of the fact that, again, you've sold that asset, that component of the asset as well, because most likely the leasee will exercise it. Okay, so that, that becomes the leasor's amount. And just to, you know, just to step back a little bit here, if we had nothing related to, uh, if we didn't have to do anything related to the guaranteed residual value, and we had no bargain purchase option, right? The present value would simply be the present value of the payments. And here would be the present value of the payments. So if it was just a straightforward present value of payments amount, this technically would be value X. In other words, the same as this, okay? But it doesn't always work out that way. The accounting for the leasee and the leasor is not symmetrical always. And in this case, if you have a present value of the guaranteed residual value, then that would make E different than X, all right? So keep that in mind. It could be this amount right here that the leasor recognizes could be X sometimes, uh, but some things throw it off where we have asymmetrical accounting. So I mean by that is the leasee and the leasor don't necessarily have e the same numbers uh, in their accounting all right um and then here well let me let me skip this first let me go over here first and then we'll go to this little exception then the other transaction that occurs is that you get payment y and that's the same amount as the y here and that reduces the receivable for the leasor and again, this occurs on the first day because usually these lease payments are made ahead of time. Then the leaseor will also create an amortization schedule. And then at the end of each period, whatever that period may be, in this case, I'm doing a year, the leaseor is going to recognize how much of that payment Y corresponds to interest revenue. And whatever amount that is, we put that amount back into the lease receivable. Okay, so uh, the other little side note I wanted to make here was if you have an unguaranteed residual value, in other words, the lease does not guarantee the residual value, then what ends up happening is that you have to subtract the present value of that unguaranteed residual value, which I'm going to call amount G, 
you're gonna have to recognize it from revenue and cost of goods sold. So it's a little bit of a quirky little uh, uh, modification you have to do here. But here's what I want you to think about. Let's highlight this here and let's compare to this. If I have a guaranteed residual value, then I can include that as the revenue. But if I don't, if I have an unguaranteed residual value under current gap, we're saying, well, wait, if that's unguaranteed, it's technically like you did not sell that component of the asset. So don't recognize revenue for that amount. All right. And uh, we'll also subtract that amount from cost of goods sold because that's like the lease or keeping that amount G. It still corresponds to the lease or. Now, at the end of the day, both this revenue minus cost of goods sold being E at minus F versus E minus G minus F minus G. I know this is sounding very mathematical, but at the end of the day, these two will end up with the same gross profit. But the idea is we're going to recognize less revenue for purposes of the income statement and less expense for the income statement if, if you have an unguaranteed residual value. Okay, this concludes my introduction to the mechanics behind uh, the finance lease. I'm going to create a separate video for the accounting uh, for the operating lease as well.